Until now, we focused on ketone and aldehyde enolates and the bases used to generate them and some of their fundamental reactions. Here I want to turn our attention briefly to ester enolates to talk about some of the issues that arise when we start thinking about deprotonating an ester. One of the nice things about an ester is that it only has one alpha carbon since the other side of the carbonyl group is occupied by an alkoxy group. However, esters bring their own set of problems and issues because the OR group has the potential to act as a leaving group. This limits on some level our choice of base because if the base we use is also a good nucleophile, that nucleophile can add to the carbonyl carbon and engage in nucleophilic A cell substitution. We need to use something that is a strong enough Bronsted base to deprotonate at the alpha position of an ester. The pKa here, remember, is a little bit higher than that for an aldehyde or ketone. It's up about 25, but also is not nucleophilic. So that strongly limits the scope of the bases we can use. If we want to generate an ester enolate quantitatively, in other words, 100% without worrying about this issue of nucleophilic acyl substitution, the most common and straightforward solution is to use a very sterically bulky base. This prevents nucleophilic addition that is strong enough to do the deprotonation in a thermodynamic sense. An LDA, lithium diisopropyl amide, fits the bill. It's got a strongly basic anionic nitrogen atom linked to two fairly bulky groups, two isopropyl groups. So it's bad at nucleophilic addition since sterically it has a hard time reaching the carbonyl carbon, but great at removing alpha protons. Whatever you do with an ester to try to generate an enolate, do not use hydroxide base because hydroxide base absolutely will not work due to a side reaction that occurs instead of deprotonation. And if you think about the potential of OR to act as a leaving group, you may have already guessed the reaction that can occur. In fact, we've seen it previously. It's a variant of nucleophilic acyl substitution called saponification or ester hydrolysis under basic conditions. What we end up with here is a nucleophilic acyl substitution process and ultimately, after a proton transfer, a carboxylate anion and an alcohol. And this isn't what we wanted to happen at all. Our prime, the group we wanted to deprotonate at the alpha carbon, didn't react at all. We ended up with a carboxylate anion instead. So don't use hydroxide bases to try to deprotonate an ester. Now, all that said, we can and commonly do, in fact, use alkoxide bases to partially form ester enolates under thermodynamic control. And this may seem like a subtle change. Why does alkoxide not present a problem where hydroxide does? Well, in fact, alkoxides do engage in this nucleophilic acyl substitution process, just like hydroxides. However, we can avoid an issue as long as we make sure that the alkoxide R group matches the alkoxy group in the ester. This makes any nucleophilic acyl substitution completely redundant. As long as the R1 in, say, the sodium alkoxide we use as the base matches this R1, substitution won't change the structure of our starting material. Even though alkoxides are not generally basic enough to affect this deprotonation completely, this is a situation similar to the use of hydroxide or alkoxides to generate a ketone or aldehyde enolate that we saw previously. We can often get by with just generating small amounts of the enolate at a time, as long as the enolate is continuously consumed through reaction with an electrophile. For example, this is used in a reaction we'll see a little bit later, the Claisen condensation. This is essentially nucleophilic acyl substitution of an ester by an ester enolate. We generate that ester enolate using an alkoxide, and that reacts with more of the ester to generate the product. Because it's continuously consumed, we don't need this initial deprotonation to be favorable.